Okay, so let's start with the next talk. Our speaker now is Alexander Bauer. He's a data science lead working for Lidl, a big uh, German discount supermarket chain. He has a PhD in computer science and already 10 years of experience. And he will tell us how to bring uh, machine learning into production environments. So he will talk about how to build a large scale machine learning pipeline using Luigi and scikit-learn. Give a warm welcome to Alexander Bauer. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm very glad to be able to present our experience with using Python, Scikit-Learn, Luigi to build large-scale machine learning pipelines. Um, I'm not here to promote specifically these technologies, although I think Python is the right language to use for, for this type of tasks. Um, more, it's more about thinking in about machine learning uh, products more Think about it more in data pipelines as well, not only in Jupyter notebooks, but also something that has to run in production. And if you do it, you get very similar problems than when you're building a data pipeline for ETL or for, for data warehouse applications. And um, so um, I'm very glad to see also that we had this talk yesterday about Airflow and from Tamara. And tomorrow there's another talk about Airflow by, by Dominic Benz, because I think this is a very relevant topic when you want to bring machine learning um, features or products into production um, to deal with these problems. And um, briefly about myself, so my name is Alexander Bauer. I'm a, a team lead for a data science team at Lidl. We're building this type of large-scale um, machine learning pipelines. And uh, this is actually, uh, I, will, I will talk you through our experience with starting with a prototype and then extending the scope of the, uh, of the pipeline and then going towards the production environment. So the agenda is, is very uh, yeah, uh, easy to see. Um, I, I talk about machine learning pipelines. In general, what does that mean? Then the challenges that we face when we go to a large-scale environment, and I will explain what means large-scale for us. Then a brief introduction on what is Luigi, what can it do, what, what does it not do, and then some code examples how we use Luigi to have machine learning components in a data pipeline. And a few lessons learned, um, some pain points that we still have that we would like to discuss also with you, get your feedback experience, how, to deal, how you did deal with those problems um, in the discussion then after the talk. So machine learning pipelines. and. Actually, no matter what type of problem you want to tackle, maybe um, customer churn or demand prediction or ad click prediction, it, it often finally boils down to something that you have some data sources from a data warehouse, a data lake maybe that you have, some application databases where you extract data that is predictive for your problem. Um, and then you feed in some type of data cleaning because data is never um, clean. It's often produced by humans that make errors and you need to kind of deal with these problems and missing data, for example. Often also you don't need all the data in the full granularity, so you do some aggregation and reduce the data. And then it really starts into the data science part where you do feature extraction, um, selecting different models, uh, doing the prediction in the end for for the real world application. Often you have some post-processing to optimize for the target metric or to have some business rules that the business wants to enforce. And then you play it out to some target uh, application or you have a stream API where someone can pull the predictions. So often anyway, this boils down to, to this uh, kind of generic framework. And if you look at this, it looks very similar to an ETL graph that you have in, in typical data warehouse application with the difference that you have machine learning components as part of this. And um, well, if you start in a research environment or as a single person and you have a new use case, a new data set, it's very easy to get started with scikit-learn, with pandas to load the data set, um, transform it, uh, fit some, some model to it. If you have Keras, you can do very, very, very easy. You can also train uh, neural networks on that. And then you do some prediction, you visualize the results, you do cross-validation. Very nice. You can impress the business how cool, uh, what cool stuff you can do. Um, but then at some point you, you run into trouble and that starts when you're scaling up basically. 
So scaling up for us means um, the data sets become bigger. You have data from 30 countries, 11,000 stores, um, thousands of articles, so your data sets become very big. Um, when you do experiments with machine learning, you have a lot of configuration options. The features that you use, the hyperparameters that you use, um, configuration of uh, which data source you use. So you will, you will end up in, with hundreds of different configurations while you're experimenting. And uh, at some point, you want to know what was the results that I had last uh, for six weeks ago. Was it any better? Did I improve along that line? So that's a challenge to deal with multiple configurations. Then um, scaling up not only means data, but it also means people. So if you want to get faster and you want to deal with all these problems, you need several data scientists working on the same problem. You have a, a mixed team with developers as well that have different focus. And everyone is modifying the code and is running its own experiments. And that's a challenge as well. How do you do this with a notebook environment? And how do you keep track of the changes that you're doing? Um, then you also have often multiple modeling steps, so you break down your models into one model per country, one model per product, so the pipeline easily gets more complicated than this simple diagram that I showed in the beginning. And uh, last but not least, at some point you need to put it into production and automatically execute all these steps. So this is scaling up and basically we have all these problems uh, at Lidl currently. Um, and we need to deal with this. And uh, in the beginning, the experience with this environment was uh, kind of painful because we were waiting a long time to run the pipeline um, to get the results when you do an experiment. Sometimes it took even two days to fully run the whole cross-validation um, and get results. Um, then the code became very messy because everyone was changing. It was hard-coded parameters. Um, you store some predictions, but you don't remember which features did I use, which hyperparameters did I use, so uh, that was also very painful and results were not really reproducible. And this makes er experimentation really hard and painful, but, and this is the critical point because you need to be able to iterate very quickly to improve, because if you wait for a week to do an experiment, you become very, very slow, and that's kind of frustrating in the end that you cannot, cannot make progress. So when we reached that point, we really thought about how can we overcome this, and we had some ideas what we can do. Uh, first of all, of course, in software engineering, you modularize, modularize your components and try to separate different processing steps. Everything needs to be config configurable. There cannot be any magic numbers in the, in the code. Um, and we don't want to recompute re every processing step again and again, so we need to somehow store all the intermediate results, and if we rerun some parts of it or change some part of it, we only want to rerun what is necessary. And uh, of course, we need at the end always know for all the results that we create, what was the configuration that I was using to cr generate this result, otherwise I cannot compare if I improved or not. And these were all ideas and, well, that's a lot of stuff to implement and think about and it's a lot of generic things to do and not really related to the use case. So that's kind of where we asked ourselves, are we reinventing the wheel here? Isn't, isn't that kind of a generic problem that other people have already tackled? And then we looked into uh, these, uh, this uh, ETL and BI uh, area where you have um, these workflow engines like Luigi, Airflow, Uzi, and, uh, and you basically transform data from one step to the other. And machine learning models, in the end, there's also just data. It's also just parameters. And um, we need to see which existing tools can we leverage in the end. So, uh, and then we came across Luigi. So we looked at Airflow and Luigi, and then Luigi looked a bit more lightweight to us, so easier to get started with. You don't need to set up a server. And, and that's why we basically started with that. And the purpose of Luigi is um, plumbing together long-running tasks. So we have a set of tasks that depend on each other. Um, you have intermediate results that you need to manage. And you have task failures, and you want to restart your processes. You want to combine multiple technologies. So you have some stuff running uh, on Hive, on Spark, so on Hadoop stacks. Some stuff is local things like scikit-learn running on, on a local edge node. 
We want to manage parameterization, and that's also something Luigi can do. And this was actually developed by Spotify and open sourced uh, a few years ago, and is easily available on PyPy, so you can just pip install Luigi, and then you can, you can get started. It has a server as well, where you can kind of inspect graphs and see how they look like, but it's not necessary to, to run that. So the philosophy of Luigi is that um, you have tasks, and every task has an input, and it has an output. And the input and output is somehow persisted into either a file, a database, a hive table, something like that, and you can define what the input and output is. And then you have tasks that depend on those tasks. So you can say the feature extraction task needs the cleaning task, and um, by this requirement, it's already clear that it needs the output of the cleaning task as an input. And this way, you can then define uh, your, your graph, your, your pipeline. And the philosophy is also that everything is Python. So there's no XML file or JSON file where you define your workflows. But it's really everything can be defined in, in code itself. And it looks like this, that you define a task and you derive it from uh, Luigi task and then you can do, you have parameters that you define, um, you would define what other task it depends on and you just return um, an instance of this class. Um, in the run component you put all the business logic that you need and you write the, the output file over here and here you define what is the output and that can be any kind of target, it can be a text file, can be a database, can be a, um, an HDFS target, uh, so it provides kind of a big uh, um, set of target, uh, target, target um, databases that you can use and you can also define your own and override them. And, and then when you execute this, it will automatically check if this some other task already run, if the results are already there and will not re-execute the thing again and that's, that's very handy. So um, now I have a bit of more code. If it's too much, we need to see, uh, because probably it's a bit complicated, but I, I just try um, how much you can grasp. And then in the end, if you have more questions, we can always talk about it. So I want to show how we use this specifically with machine learning tasks. So one, one issue was uh, the model training task and how do we store the models and manage the models. And so we defined a, a model, modeling task which has some kind of parameters like the date when the model is trained, <laughs> the configuration of the hyperparameters of this model, the feature configuration, which uh, of the feature extraction do I want to use, and then I define where I want to store the model, and here I also put the configuration name, feature name, training date, so when I store the model, I also put in the, in the file name all the data that is required to identify how I run it. So this way I always know which parameters did I use for this model when I later use it for prediction. So that's very handy to manage models in, uh, on the long run. Uh, we have dependency of this task, so it depends on the feature extraction task, and you, are, you then just hand over the configuration for the feature extraction, which is uh, based on a config file. So also this task then knows which features to produce, and if it's already computed, already on Hive, or or the file system, it will not run again. And then you have the business logic itself where you load the configuration, load the features, fit some model, and then finally serialize it and store it in the target output file um, where that you defined over here. And that's a pretty neat way to, to write a task and integrate it in this Luigi framework. Um, and that's why, that's also one of the reasons this simplicity to uh, define uh, graphs is, is very nice. Um, so that was ans one aspect. The other one is to do the prediction. Um, maybe I don't go too much into details here. It's basically the similar approach that you have an output, you define uh, a target where you store it, and then you require the model, the train model task, you hand over the configuration, uh, the feature extraction as ex actually is not necessary because it's dependent here. I just wanted to show that you can also put multiple dependencies and you can then label them also um, in, a, in a dictionary. Yeah, and then another aspect is if you have a graph that um, is composed of multiple tasks, for example, if you say, I need to make a prediction but I have a model per country, 
So I, gen I can generate tasks on the fly, or I can, if I want to do an ensemble here, I can say I need three models to make the, make the ensemble prediction. I can, uh, I can just do a for loop. No, where's the pointer? Just uh, loop over the model configs and just return a prediction task for each of those. And then it dynamically generates those tasks and executes them. So um, yeah, when we use this in, in our example, the pipeline is a bit more complicated. So we do a model for each article in our, um, uh, in our example here. And we have tasks to simulate costs that we produce with our model to optimize the costs on top. So that goes also in optimizing the target metric. We have all the ETL tasks also as part of this job. And if we just run the top one, the top node, it will automatically just produce all the other results that are required. And that's very nice because even if you have a Hadoop cluster with uh, redundancy and everything, there's always, I mean, Murphy's law tells you there's always something that gets, goes wrong. And in this case, if any of those nodes goes wrong, um, it will then pick it up again, repeat it, or if you restart the job, it will just execute the parts that are required to, to be executed. <coughs> So to conclude the talk and to have some time for discussion as well, um, the benefits of using a workflow engine like Airflow or Luigi is to have faster and less painful experimentation. And that's a very important aspect when you are uh, in a scaled environment, when you have multiple people in your team, when you have large data sets. Um, if, you, uh, if you make sure that you always store the configuration with your data set that you produce, you get reproducible results. You can anytime compare where did my model get better compared to the previous one. There's no need to rename files and to have directories that you manage. It's all done automatically. Um, and you get a sustainable, sustainable code structure that leads to a robust implementation also in production. So this is already very close to production. We have it in A-B tests at the moment where we compare with the legacy system and uh, we're confident to kind of improve like a few percent and that's, that's quite a lot in, uh, in the scale that we're working at at the moment. So um, lessons learned, so not everything is perfect uh, as, as usual. So um, Luigi itself doesn't have a database where it stores um, if the task completed or not. So it solely relies on is the file available on HDFS. And so, and if you do a file check in, in, in Hadoop, you always start off with JVM. And that takes a few seconds. So if you have these 100 tasks and it's checking whether they already run, it takes like uh, minutes until it just uh, starts working. And with, with Luigi, there comes also a small Python-based uh, HDFS client called Snakebyte. And with this one, it's very fast to do these uh, file existence checks. Um, another lesson is that we learned that tasks should be small and modular so that you can also, and you should also outsource the heavy lifting parts to Sparks, like aggregation tasks are not very, very quick in Pandas. It's single threaded and it also the memory of your edge node might not be big enough. So there it makes sense to just uh, execute Spark jobs from Luigi, from within Luigi. And we, we also got rid of a lot of for loops that we had in our code, and that was very nice also for readability of the code. So instead of looping, having several nested loops, we just generated tasks on the fly, and then we could track the, the progress more easily than having one big task that failed, and then you need to restart again. Um, one thing that is important to think about is sustainable structure for your output files so that you can then on the long run also uh, keep track of them. So for example, have a directory for which feature set you use, a directory for the model configuration, um, and then the naming of your, of your output file. And then it's pretty easy to, to look up uh, old uh, results. Open issues, I think, for Luigi and maybe the, in general, the, this workflow domain is how to debug Spark uh, tasks because Spark tasks run on, on the cluster and if you don't run them in client mode, you don't get any direct feedback so you cannot break point somewhere and then see what happened at that point. But that's a bit of a challenge. Um, another one is that 
starting up the Spark context takes also like 30 seconds until it runs, and if you have like 100 tasks using Spark, you wait for that time. So it would be cool to have some Spark context reuse in those workflow engines as well, that it only starts the Spark context once and then just uh, submits jobs against this. I'm sure there's a library which can, can do this, but the in integration would be nice to have. Um, then with Luigi specifically, the, it checks if the file exists. So if, if you want to rerun the task because there was a bug in there, you need to delete the output file. And that was very dangerous because often you didn't do an RM minus R, a recursive delete. And it happened like two or three times that we deleted the whole, uh, the whole main directory and we didn't need to recover from the backup. So that's kind of a, a dangerous uh, thing to do. Uh, so it would be good to have like a command reset this task and then it just do, does it automatically, some, some protection uh, from your own mistakes. And another, another thing was when using Hive and uh, you want to write files to HGFS and then you want to put H, uh, Hive on top, that you have some way of consistency checking that, uh, that uh, the files that you create um, comply with the schema. So that was also a challenge sometime that you're writing the wrong um, schema and then the, all the Hive tables, they, they break basically. Uh, but overall, our experience was very good. Um, we're not sure if we're using Luigi in the end or if we're using Airflow, um, but I'm sure we will be using a workflow engine. The benefits are so big and uh, we don't want to go back to like individual notebooks and stuff like that. It's good if you want to have a small experiment that you do in an hour and then you do a presentation. But for production, you need a kind of a framework that takes care of all these uh, failures and configuration issues that you, that you get. No. Okay, so that concludes my talk. Uh, so yeah, call for action for you. Consider using a pipeline tool when you are not doing it already. Um, enable your team to do reproducible research. It will pay off in the long run. And avoid building too much technical debt in the beginning of your project. So think about what does it mean to put this into production quite early and always keep your intermediate results um, so you can learn from the improvement that you make. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Questions to this talk? Um, thanks for that talk, that was awesome. Um, I, I got ahead of the questions. I'm going to try sneak in two. Mm -hmm. uh, one quick one. Can you use this architecture to train online models? And two, uh, what advice would you give yourself for Kaggle like five years ago? <laughs> <laughs> like, or, or your, no, your five year ago self, what do you wish you knew that you don't know now? Okay. So the first one was, um, would you use this in a, in a streaming online environment? I would definitely say no. Um, you can use it to train the models because that's a batch operation that you maybe do once a month or once a week. Um, but if you want to do something in streaming environment or online training of the models, you definitely need a different approach. Um, and that could be to have Docker images of your model that you can put in front of a load balancer and, and then just do the prediction on that. So I think it could be a combination of the Luigi part or the, the workflow part for training the models and for the scoring you definitely need something that is more responsive and uh, it doesn't have all these ramp up times that we currently have. But for our application right now, we are mostly in supply chain environment where we do a prediction per day and for that, it's perfectly fine to do it. And I think Spotify also, if you have Spotify, um, it does the recommendation once a, once a week, then you get your new recommendation, and that's also uh, good enough for them. Yeah. Yeah. And the second one, what five years ago, what, wish, what did I wish to know about machine learning or Kaggle in general, right? Um, I think when I started with machine learning, I was very excited with all the algorithms part. And as a computer scientist, this is so fascinating. There's so much math and, and general uh, knowledge that you can gain. But um, what I learned very painfully is it's not the algorithm that makes the difference. It's 
the understanding of the problem, so talking to the users, understanding what do I actually want to optimize and what do I want to predict. And then it's about feature engineering, understanding the data, um, visualizing it, uh, breaking your head about how can I feed better data to the model. And this should be like 80% of your work when you do a data science project. And that's also the same case in Kaggle, that understanding the data is very crucial and that's where you need to spend the most time. And it's kind of an art, but uh, to practice and reading up old uh, previous competition, you can learn a lot and exchange with other people, mix ideas. That's uh, something I had to learn because I was also very fascinated with technology at that time. With deep learning, it's a bit different. Um, I find it also sometimes a bit more boring because most of the time you're waiting for your model to, to, um, to complete. But also here, often you have additional data, not only the image, you have some other data that you can bring in and that you should always consider to do. So feed as much information and prior that you have to the model. Yeah. More questions? Um, thanks for the talk. Um, you mentioned that you are uh, thinking about switching to Airflow. Mm -hmm. um, what do you hope to gain by doing that? Okay, so um, one aspect is that the platform that we're using, we have a platform team that is managing all that and also they do the operation. They, um, they proposed Airflow to, to use Airflow because it has a central server, it has a database where you track the results and I think also the support from the Apache community is much stronger than the community is stronger around Airflow, the more momentum is there. Um, but other than that, I think both options are, are good. Here with Luigi, you need a scheduler on top of it, so it doesn't have its own scheduler, but uh, it shouldn't be a problem to set a cron job or any other scheduler that is available to trigger it. So it's mostly operational aspects that uh, pro support this decision. More questions? Maybe some comments to the open issues? Yeah, this is more of a question. Yeah. So could you elaborate a bit on how you use also your system when you assess the quality of the models? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have, uh, so we not only have training and prediction tasks, we have also a cross-validation tasks, and that is doing the calculation of the error metrics. Um, we have tasks that produce Excel files for for people to look at the results. Um, we have tasks that put it also in a SQL database so we can do visualizations on top of this. So you can, you can attach any types of um, kind of inspection task on top of that. And for, for, for example, for demand prediction, we use typical error metrics like root mean square error and this kind of things. But we also run simulation of what would have happened if we would have used the model because our business goals is not root mean square error, it's like euro or loss of sales or additional revenue and that's also built into the pipeline actually. So we use it both for the experimental evaluation part and also for the production part, you just have different workflow elements that are, that are running at that point. You said in the beginning that you um, link all the results to your uh, configurations mm -hmm. and you just said that you store your evaluation metrics yeah. um, in CSV or in Excel files and yeah. in a SQL databases. How do you store uh, the feature, like uh, the knowledge about the features that were used? Um, so we have, a, we have a feature configuration file. So that's a JSON file that defines all the features and we have feature generator classes so, for example, one is to uh, generate lagged sliding window features, sales of last six months on a certain day or for a certain store. And uh, this is all configurable to, to a JSON file and we store the JSON file together with the uh, with, uh, uh, data. So you can always link it together. And, uh, but you need to be, I mean, the, you need to be careful if you change the code because we don't store the the Git version or the, you know, the, the commit, maybe that would be an enhancement to also store what was the source code version that we were using at that point. Yeah. Uh, hi, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, and I feel your pain points because we are pretty much at the same point right now. Mm -hmm. um, because the workflow is a mess. 
Um, maybe you've seen the keynote this morning about Dask. Um, uh, unfortunately, no. Okay. Yeah. Um, have you evaluated Dask in the process where you were looking for a workflow engine? No, not yet. Not at all? Okay, because that would have been my question, how uh -huh. you would compare Dask to, to Luigi and Airflow and why you choose Luigi over yeah. Dask. Yeah, it, it's definitely worth to look at all the latest developments that are happening and it's, there's so much momentum in this uh, community at the moment. Um, I think for us it's important to look also at maturity, so I don't know about maturity of this tool, but definitely we'll have a look at that as well. And like one of the challenges that we have, for example, is to parallelize the machine learning part. Currently it's sequential and we could do it with Spark, but it's a bit tricky, so maybe that's an option to overcome uh, that problem. Yeah. Thanks. One more question. Thanks a lot for the talk. Was using a Python stack in general a given for that kind of problem um, in your company, or did it have any strong contenders, technology-wise? Uh, no, actually, when I when I joined the company, they were using R as the main language, just for I don't know historic reasons. Um, in general, I leave the team to decide what technology they want to use. Of course, it has to be kind of not too exotic because we need to maintain it and we need to train everyone on it. And I think for me, I, I'm really a supporter of Python. I've used it in the past for production use cases as well. And for me, it's, it's the right trade-off between um, something that is high performing, like Scala or, or things like that, and an R which is very scientific and you have all the exotic libraries. I think Python is the right trade-off to use. And if you manage to outsource all the heavy lifting parts um, that involve a lot of data and, uh, and just a lot of aggregation to Spark or a SQL engine, I think it's, it's, a, it's a perfect language also for going into production environment. Of course, there's always, I mean, there's always special cases where you have really uh, a real-time case where you have a latency requirement of less than 20 milliseconds. I mean, there's always limits for technology, but for us it's... Uh, it's something the team has chosen and also something that we support and, and strongly believe in. Okay, so let's uh, all thank the speaker again with this nice praise for Python.